Oh. I just love the tones so much. Baba. Oh boy. <laughs> I think he had an idea it might come to this. ガルザルに合わせていただけませんか。ダメだ。傷の具合はどうですか。知るかそんなもん。なんで俺が手下の敵を解放しなきゃなんねんだよ。お前アルネズをジジイの家に送り。Love <laughs> the glow coming out of the cabin or the long house. This framing. だよ。歩いて送り返せってのかよ。<laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe she could use this. Oh, I need to use it. 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 That's a statement right there, my guy. Might come back to you. She really is quite lovely, isn't she? Oh. Oh. <笑>なあ、切ってくれ。アルネス。はあ。オーマイガード。おい。なあ、大丈夫だ。縄を切るような道具は持ってね。亭主がわざわざ迎えに来てくれたんだぞ。手当てなんて言わねえで、もっといい
Holy shit. It's gone then. Consequences. Fuck. Oh my god. Whew. I'm so happy they used that score or brought it back. Oh, this should be the aftermath. Oh my god, it's a massacre. Oh. Oh. Oh god. <笑>どうしてあんなに人を傷つけて平気でいられたのか想像もつかないよ。いや。ああ。世の中から戦争と奴隷をなくすことはできないかって。前に言ってただろう。俺には夢みたいな話に見える。ファンタスティックドリーム
それじゃダメなんだ平和のために戦争してちゃ意味がないそんなんじゃあの殺し合いの地獄からは抜け出せないわやっぱり夢みたいな話は夢みたいなままかどこか死の果て果ての果てにでも行かなきゃそんな仲間外れの Life for the outcast. 人間のための土地 He's thinking about something. Mimi no Kanata Made Nigekitara. So Kuni, oh, Nani Garu no Kashira. Season one. Oh, oh, Nani Monaimane. Unforgettable moments. Doko Made Temo, Kokoto Nazi. Um, Hordaland. Hold Hordaland. Yeah, and then he tells her about that place. Oh, wow. Imagine that Thorfinn. <laughs> Ugh. Oh, here it comes. Aenor hearing about this for the first time. Oh. For a time, of course, because... Look at this. Ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-
um, on top of everything else she's been going through um, in her, you know, uh, recent life because she kind of needed some sort of closure and she just knew she'll regret it for the rest of her life if she doesn't go to Garter, right? Um, and then to show up there and, you know, expect, I mean, you know, showing up there expecting this, you know, uh, runaway slave, crazed or mad runaway slave, the description or the profile that Snake attaches to Garter right she's expecting to see that uh, a completely changed man you know she said earlier i was afraid of him she's expecting to see all of that on display but once she gets there you know the things that she hears from her husband i mean it just completely um flips things upside down for her um she was not expecting to see this human side of him again Right? Heartbroken, full of sorrow, apologetic, so apologetic, so just so full of regret that he made that choice all that time ago. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to get into, uh, I, you know, again, the pros and cons of it because I kind of, uh, I spoke on that in the last episode's discussion, right? Hindsight and all that, you know, was it a good choice? Uh, you know, all that stuff. It's in the last episode's discussion. But the thing is, he himself, feels that he he made a, a really bad choice back then a choice that led to this um and the thing is seeing him like that uh you know in turn she feels the need to apologize as well now right for essentially giving up on him she i mean she uh, at first in the last episode she she was really quite I don't know, detached. Uh, she was really quite, I don't know, rock solid in her belief that, okay, you know, I just kind of have to hang back, let the storm pass by. I, you know, uh, I actually thought she's actually probably just dying inside, but she's keeping it together. Maybe there was an element of that, but it, it appears that indeed she was able to kind of separate uh, who her husband used to be from the person she saw approach her on that horse and the person he's become um so to see her break down after seeing this side of him that she was not expecting to see um my goodness it's tough you know and this is this is one of the areas the voice acting just really shines and you see it, at that moment the breakdown as she puts her face in her hands right um because all of a sudden all of a sudden now there's this glimmer of hope, this glimmer of false hope even, maybe. You know, there's just enough there, a semblance of a possibility that they could potentially have a life together again. You know, maybe, just maybe if they could get out of this. I mean, you can just tell that she's feeling so much guilt at that point as well, right? For distancing herself, for being cold earlier. And you see that Garter himself is really quite perplexed, right? Um, he's just quite baffled at the notion of her being so apologetic. He feels that it's his responsibility, that it was his mistake that led to all of this. He's taking responsibility for it. He's just heartbroken for all the pain he put her through. And, you know, the thing is, oh my God, he doesn't even know about his child. He doesn't even know that child is dead at this point. And she's simply not able to bring that up. And, you know, it's honestly so heartbreaking to see these people meet or having to meet in this manner, in this capacity, right? Um, in the presence of these other men, uh, these men that are just kind of joking about, uh, you know, really silly things. See, the thing is, her hand is forced once again. She gets swept up uh, by the storm once again because of a split second choice Garter made. To rip out that guy's throat. And you know, there's that moment as she clutches her belly. Imagine being in that position. You only have a few seconds to make a choice at this point. And she's thinking at that point uh, about not, not even just herself. Mainly her child. And the choice she ends up making is of cutting the ropes. And 
getting out of there. So, you know, I don't want this to be taken as me just, you know, shitting on Garter because I do feel for the man. I do. But the thing is, you know, his split second choice, his, his decision, it's implicated uh, Arnhi almost immediately. But also, she did go out there, right? She did go out there. And I spoke of this, you know, there's going to be consequences for that. Um, she is playing a role in this. And because of that choice, a few more men just died, right? Her doing that directly led to their death. And you see that Snake is, yeah, he's not messing around anymore, right? Usually he's a little bit laid back in his approach. You know, he's really quite calm and composed and really quite effective and impressive. But now he's about to be quite effective and impressive and be quite angry at the same time. You know, now he's really quite uh, agitated, truly agitated at this point. Uh, you see that Gramps, um, you know, he just has one look at Snake and he knows, he knows this man is not about to stop until he hunts Garter down and perhaps Arn Heat as well. See, as of this point, it's not clear. Um, I mean, it's not clear to Garter either. He doesn't have context how exactly it happened. You know, all he knows is that the ropes are cut. Um, you know, of course, it's one of the frames that, that, that they do focus on, you know, the, the knife and the cut rope uh, and the sword that has the grease on it. And that's how they found out that indeed someone stabbed Garter. So on top of the injury he already had, he's got this new one. And now, you know, Snake is after him. Listen, you know, let's let's be realistic here. Garter is not going to be around for much longer, is he? Um, I just don't see how they could possibly escape, right? Um, I'm not, I mean, they can't. As of this point, they cannot escape the farm. You know, they just, he's injured. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out the next time I do get to see them on screen. Um, but, you know, it, it was interesting that, that they are focusing on Gramps, right? Uh, does Gramps know something that I don't? Um, the, the, but the thing I do know is that you can read quite a bit into his look. Or the look on his face, right? He sees Snake in that mood, uh, and he knows. You know, there's a striking shot, the final shot of the episode of Snake. Whew. I mean, there's there's actually some really incredible shots of Snake in this episode. Of course, the immediate aftermath, uh, and I, I love that presentation. It didn't need to show us Garter going ape shit on those guards. You know, four or five of them got butchered, massacred. And, you know, speaking of the score, as you saw, I got really quite excited uh, to to hear that specific track um, come back in. The name of that track is Intertwined, and it's one of my favorites from season one. Uh, it's, it's on my workout playlist as well. I just love that track. Um, and the inclusion of that really just, you know, got me going. You know, I, I was really quite happy. Uh, I got really into it. Uh, but, you know, at no point was I celebrating that man dying, right? Listen, the man who died, whose throat got ripped out, he was really quite kind to Arnheim. I mean, yes, as he stated himself, you know, that's his downfall, isn't it? Uh, I'm not able to say no to a woman. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's a cute moment as he's kind of, you know, not able to even look at her because she's so beautiful, right? He, he turns to the other side and he's, he's blushing at that moment. Um, I don't know. I know it's kind of crazy. You know, these these are mercenaries or he's a mercenary uh, in that era. Uh, but something about that was kind of wholesome. Right. Uh, and I feel like it is by design because, you know, a few moments later, he gets his throat ripped out. Anytime I get a bit of a callback to season one. Right. Uh, I just get really quite excited, you know, be it uh, the score, some of the music from season one uh, being used here, uh, be it footage scenes you have full scenes being utilized here in this episode Hordeland from uh season one episode eight i believe she goes out there on the longboat uh to bring thorfinn some food uh and it's it's you know it really is one of the most memorable scenes of se season one for me at least you know so the moment i saw that line of dialogue pop up at the bottom of the screen right and then of course Hordeland herself is uh shown again it almost immediately transported me to that time 
around that time I was watching uh, season one. Uh, that, of course, you know, that iconic moment of Leaf uh, from episode one, I believe, right? As he's telling his story. Um, iconic. And the fact that Thorfinn still thinks about her from time to time, that she's always on his mind, that he must be thinking, ah, if only I could, I don't know, if I could turn back time, if only I could help her. And it feels like another one of those moments that he just hates himself for. Right? You see that he's really quite embarrassed. And I think embarrassed is actually putting it lightly. He's disgusted with his past self. And moments like that must just kind of haunt him, right? Play over and over in his mind. I believe he calls his past self pathetic, right? And he's just afraid and embarrassed for someone like Arnhi to ever find out the type of person he used to be. He's disgusted that he had such disregard for human life once upon a time. Not too long ago, actually, right? He cannot recognize himself anymore. I mean, he's completely disgusted with himself for, for spreading that violence, right? But to finish off the Garter and Arnheed segment, she's given this newfound hope, right? A glimmer of hope. Um, and this newfound fear, once again, of losing each other all over again. And also, essentially, her two closest friends are Aner and Thorfinn. So, you know, <laughs> there's, there's still a chance that they might get kind of dragged into it. You know, I know it sounds kind of negative to say they might get dragged into it, but uh, I don't know. Let's say maybe there might be an opportunity for them to potentially help, right? Depending on how things play out. I mean, one thing I know for sure, if indeed she does come across Thorfinn and Aner and she asks for help, or, you know, she's in a position that requires help, their help, there's no doubt in my mind that Aner is going to just step right up. Now let's shift the focus to Aner and Thorfinn's segment. It's quite a contemplative segment. A lot of self-reflection, uh, breakthrough, full circle moments, right? Him, him remembering um, that land once again, that place that sounds too good to be true. He remembers Vinland. It's an incredible moment, right? Uh, he, he just completely remembers that. And, you know, I love that that specific scene of him describing it to Aner. And that's, again, a big moment. Aner hearing about it for the first time. And, you know, it, it does give him hope. It gives him something to latch on to. And, again, one of the main talking points to come out of this is that notion of atonement. He feels that he's not even close. I mean, at this point in time, Thorfinn's conscious desire is as clear as it's ever been, as structured as it's ever been. It's just so incredible to see Thorfinn at this point in his growth, right? To, again, have such structured thoughts about the near future or the future that he hopes for. Um, and yeah, you know, one of the main components of this is atonement. He believes he's not even close to atoning for all of his sins. And, you know, I think that was actually one of the most significant talking points of my discussion for the season one finale. Um, I think, yeah, I think a lot of the things I spoke of in that finale discussion, yeah, you know, I think they're at play now. They're, they're most definitely at play at this point. That notion of atonement, self-reflection, self-improvement, correction, right? And as expected really early on in this season and as already kind of showcased throughout the season. Uh, and then once again in this scene, Aner, my goodness, he is so important for Thorfinn. So important for his growth. This is someone who can listen to Thorfinn, who wants to listen to Thorfinn, who wants to understand his ideas, get something out of them. Thorfinn needed this. He needs to get his ideas out. He needed to get all of these thoughts out. And I'm sure it's the same for many of you, uh, but it's been such an incredible experience, such a fulfilling one, a satisfying one. You know, seeing Thorfinn progressing through the deconstruction phase, then the reconstruction phase, and now towards wholeness, right? As he tackles his personal history, his demons, the ghosts of his past. I mean, he carries the ghosts of his past, doesn't he? Much like his late father, Thor's. I need to take them someplace they can rest, 
peacefully. And my God, that one frame, that one frame of, again, him and his ghosts. Oof, it's yeah, it's got to be one of the one of the shots of the season. I mean, it is such an evocative shot, isn't it? And even though he cannot bear the burden of adding even one more. Right onto himself, you see that he has accepted it. At this point, he's carrying it at all times. He's carrying them at all times, like Thor's was as well. Right? This, at this point, you know, he's not being dragged down, he's bringing them along. So I, I just love, I just love the storytelling on display here. I mean, the visual storytelling in this episode is just fantastic. You know, that's, an, that's a great example of it right there. But, you know, it's using um, the climate, of course, Garter and Arnheed's meeting or reunion um, is accompanied by dark clouds, the storm, right? As she breaks down, it begins to rain as well. Um, yeah, just, you know, right then and there, the visual depiction of uh, that scene, it just... I just don't feel that anything good's about to come out of it. You know, like I said, I'm not I'm not really seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. But speaking of the light at the end of the tunnel, you see it's quite the opposite for that scene. You see as Thorfinn is having that moment of clarity, the skies clear up. Bright sunshine by the end of it. Um it is just beautiful. Right? It's hopeful. Right? There's a stunning shot of the sun beaming through the clouds. Uh, my God, the frames, the frames in this one are just beautiful, beautiful, really quite memorable. Um, I, you know, I might actually even just use all those frames for my post episode discussion for this one. But going back to Aner being such a fantastic screen partner for Thorfinn, you know, there's, a, I think there's actually set up here for quite a compelling drama as well, right? Uh, because you see that Aner also makes for... Uh, quite an effective, quite a functional counter uh, to Thorfinn in this in this case, and I think it's really needed as well, right? Um, you know, he he functions as a bit of a challenge uh, to his newfound resolve, to his newfound belief, because realistically speaking, Thorfinn's newfound resolve is one of this idealistic dreamer. You could argue that it is a little bit naive, isn't it? Um, this notion of his rigid pacifism that he, that he that he is kind of channeling at this point, uh, and you know he appears to be really quite locked in already into it, um, as he hopes to achieve that land of peace, you know, to perhaps resolve war and enslavement without violence, even if it is just one village, one new nation. And the thing I like here is that Thorfinn himself understands that this is really quite unrealistic. It is. But that's the reason I say that it's one of an idealistic dreamer. He understands that, you know, he's truly going against a grain, right? He's going to have to be a radical, essentially. He understands that the Norse culture isn't going to just change overnight, right? It's a way of life. I mean, it's this glorified system built into the fabric of that culture. That is not something that, that can just change all of a sudden. He he understands this. He's realistic about it. So instead, he has notions of creating a nation, right? This is the first time they drop something of this magnitude. And they've hinted at this as well, right? You go all the way back to episode one again, the narration, Aner's narration specifically, right? Um, the thing is, you know, it's almost as if I'm already kind of getting my answer. Uh, that both Thorfinn, I mean, of course, Thorfinn is not going to die <laughs> at, at any point in this season. But it also kind of tells me that Aner is not going to die. Maybe he could be in danger, but I know that he's not really going to die. Um, but yeah, you know, a, a nation of like-minded individuals, other outcasts like himself and Aner, all of them can go to this place together where they can create and prosper without the need to take up the swords to defend themselves. But going back to my point about Aner being this counter, you know, this challenge to Thorfinn's newfound resolve and belief, um, you know, he, he puts it out there. You know, I, I, I have no love for war, but sometimes it's necessary that violence can be a necessary evil. 
Sometimes, sometimes you must commit to it in order to protect that freedom, to preserve the peace of life from aggressors, from outside aggressors, right? So I, I love that it's kind of set up that compelling drama. But you see that Thorfinn kind of rejects that notion. He, he, he refuses to accept it, you know, regardless of the justifications for it. And I'm really quite excited to see how this develops because there's going to be moments that are going to test his resolve. And, you know, that might be coming up real soon, real soon. I mean, first of all, his buddy Knut is on the horizon after all of this, right? And hell, you know, even before that, if indeed Arnhi does approach them um, or comes across them and, you know, they end up helping, that, you know, they're going, they're going to find themselves up against Snake, opposite to Snake. But, you know, speaking of Canute, his old buddy, I, you know, I love how essentially both of them have similar ideas, similar notions of utopia, uh, the promised land. You see that Canute is taking the opposite approach. He has fully committed to the notion or accepted that violence is necessary, right? The ends justify the means. He is open to this. He feels it's necessary to establish, to accomplish his utopia, heaven on earth. But yeah, you know, to kind of end it off, yes, Thorfinn's dream is exceedingly difficult to achieve, um, perhaps really quite unrealistic as well, right? Um, and, you know, perhaps a little bit naive, but damn, does it feel incredible to watch him uh, find his voice, you know, find his path to atonement, you know, to replant, to rebuild, to somehow atone for all the destruction he caused, all the life he took, all the beauty he took. It feels incredible to see him find his reason, you know, to see him striving towards that dream, you know, striving to be better. But yeah, I think that should do it for this one, folks. If you enjoyed that, consider dropping a like, consider dropping some comments, giving your thoughts. If you're interested in full length, timer-based full length, of course, or perhaps even full opacity, consider checking out the Patreon page. The links are in the description and the pinned comment. Also links to social media, if that's your thing. Right then, thank you so much for joining me, folks. And thank you for your time because time is precious. It really is. And I do hope to see you again soon for episode 16. Until then, Take it easy.